Um, let's get started. OK, sure. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei, and I'm a faculty member at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And today, I'm going to uh, tell you about our experience of deploying a 200-node OpenStack cluster for research purposes. And we will, uh, I will co-present with uh, Dr. Yang Shuo sitting here from Huawei Technology and show how their open source project really helped our deployment. So a little bit background is that we started building our 200 node server cluster uh, since late last year. So it has been in operation for about nine months. And uh, th there's two goals to building this cluster. First is production. So we are trying to support hundreds of researchers, including faculty and students, to run big data, so-called big data workload. That means Hadoop, that means Spark, these kind of things. And also, I am a system researcher. We do distributed system research. So especially, we want to try to build the next generation of cloud infrastructure. And this platform is also uh, the test environment for my own research. So the outline of the talk is that first we'll talk about how, why we choose OpenStack and why we use that. And we'll tell you about our customers uh, and also our research vision. Then we focus on what kind of current immediate problems we have in operating such infrastructure and how the campus, the Huawei open source technology, uh, saves the day. So let's give you a quick, profile, uh, quick overview of the profile of our customers. Right? So if you are thinking about the university, if you're thinking about scientific research, the first thing you think is a uh, high performance computing or HPC world. I say, OK, I, I wish I had a requirement like that. So this is a heaven for system means. So if you are not familiar with that, this is called ROCKS cluster, it's very popular in HPC world. So why? Because it's so simple. Everything is distributed on those CDs, they call rows. So you put the row into the machine, install the OS in one machine, and then it will copy into different other machines, and then you, you have a cluster up and running. So if the customer wants a specific package, well, you, you look for it, whether it's in some other rows you haven't installed. But the only way you manage packets, you manage software on your infrastructure is by using the pre-packaged CDs and then you install. But how about if there is a soft software application that's not available, then we say sorry to the customer. There's no way to really hack into this, install separate packages without breaking the whole thing. Right? So that's the way HPC has been working for years. But different for us is that we do have a variety of applications. So we have uh, some people running scientific image processing. So these are a lot of uh, images of certain roof fly. I don't know what that is. But, and also we have brain connectivity study. We have some social big data thing. For example, we run a, like a large scale online education, so-called MOOCs. So for example, this course has uh, 26,000 enrollments. So we analyze the student behavior, try to predict how well they learn. We do social network mining. And we do also do something like natural language processing. All these applications has a lot of dependencies. These dependencies has a hardware dependency. Say this one has a, you know, this one has a very little hardware dependency. This requires moderate CPU memory and hard drive. But it has a lot of software dependency. It depends on a lot of different things because all these research code are written by different research groups who use different technology, whatever technology the students know. And then they try to put everything together. And these workloads are sometimes uh, resource hungry too. For example, this one is a genome computation type of workload. So human genome. Each human genome is like a little less than one gigabytes of data. And then they try to compare hundreds of people comparing the genome. It's like doing a lot of string comparisons on random strings. And this require, definitely requires a lot of CPU power, a lot of disk storage, store them, and a lot of I.O. bandwidth, and of course, networking. Right? And 
it requires a lot. Like all the res research code, it's like a use a different kind of uh, technology, different kind of very researchy type of code, very immature and very difficult to maintain, large variety. Even worse, the single customer's needs can change. For example, this is from one of my colleagues who do, does computational biology. He does a protein design. He tries to predict what the protein, the 3D infrastructure should look like after he modified one um, kind of uh, amino acid inside that. Initially, his requirement is simple. He just requires a bunch of uh, CPU power to do their A star search kind of algorithm. Very soon, he figured, yeah, there is an A star search algorithm runs on GPU. I want GPU. That's still simple, right? So GPU is runs on a single machine. We just add a couple of GPU run, adding drivers. And then later, he figured it's really the memory bounded. In a single box, you can only, I can only provide half a terabyte of memory. That's the max I can probably provide in an economical way. And then he wants more memory. So he heard about Hadoop and moved to Hadoop. But it caused a lot of distributed infrastructure change and requires different hardware resources, also the software change. Then he is now moving to Spark because he thinks that this is slow. It's an iterative uh, process. It's essentially what Spark is targeting at. He said it's a perfect fit for Spark. Then we need to do the entire uh, thing again. So it's uh, difficult to maintain such uh, ch like changing requirement of customer. Right? So that really leads to our long ter longer term research vision. We do system research. Uh, the, before I tell you the vision, so the, the, so summarize the motivation. The first one is customer really wants flexibility. This is a quote from uh, Nature magazine. It says, uh, it should not be the scientists who are required to be flexible. It really should be the cluster that should be flexible. Why people say that? That's because it comes from OHPC world. You, are, you must be flexible in what kind of language you write it in and what kind of uh, distributed infrastructure. It's MPI cluster, now you need to run MPI. Right? So this is motivation one. Second motivation is that scientific computation is a resource hungry. Unlike most of IT infrastructure, they really care about performance because what the data, the data is huge, the problem is difficult. So this guy is a professor, David Hausler from UC Santa Cruz. He is famous because he is a pioneer in the human genome project. In one of our system research conference, he gave a keynote there. And at the last, he said, OK, everything why we haven't cured cancer, the computational biology doesn't work, is because of the goddamn IO. Right? So they care about performance. The performance kills their application. The third motivation is that in a research environment, we do have a complex infrastructure. So we get whatever economical to buy, you know, 200 nodes. And, but we really do not have many IT staff to support this infrastructure. So during the daytime, I only have one single system administrator managing from, you know, from the cleaning the room all the way up to all the software infrastructures. And at night, I have to do it personally. <laughs> Why? Because the university pays IT staff overtime. They don't pay faculty overtime. So they want me to do it. So that's uh, our, all our IT team to manage the entire thing, including the software. So what is difficult to manage IT infrastructure? I came from Google. So why not two person cannot manage the entire thing? First is heterogeneity. Right? So we have different hardware, different software, different applications. Right? So in this research environment. And everything change. Second is that we have a layers of abstractions make it impossible to understand the root cause you know, once something goes wrong. Well, I love abstractions. Right? So because it's a common saying that all problems in computer science can be solved by adding another level of abstraction. But a lot of people don't, don't say the second part is except for there are many, the problem caused by many levels of abstractions. Right, so debugging or debuggability is one of the examples in this kind. You abstract away the, the interface, making it easy to program, but you also hide all the details, allow you to efficiently debug the system. So that's why 
come to our research vision, is longer term research vision is that we want to do a data driven big data infrastructure. Without abstractions, nobody can understand the system. But we say, okay, with data, who cares you understand the system or not? It's all a bunch of data correlations in the system. So we make the data collection the first class citizen. We do cross layer data analysis. We just based on all the statistics effect, we tune the infrastructure. How do we tune that? Well, we have SDN, we have software defined storage. That's all built into our infrastructure, but we just don't know how to tune the parameter yet. So we think with data driven approach, we can better tune the applications. We can make it easier to debug, easier to manage. So here is our proposed infrastructure. We are currently building this. Is that uh, it looks the same as normally people draw like a big data infrastructure, you know, different layers, networking, storage. You build Hadoop look at framework, and then you build application on top. What's different is that we add this cross layer data collection thing. We analyze the data independent of all these uh, interface abstractions. We analyze them together. We try to automatically understand what's going on in the system. And then we feed it back. So we use the software defined technology in order to fine tune this. In order to run this research, we have a fairly large team of about uh, 20 people like, working on this. In order to really run this, we have to have some kind of a technology in order to deploy this and maintain this in a production type of quality type. Remember, we still have real customers. So, but the production part is our short-term problem, is operational issues. Let me try to summarize that. The day one problem is how do we, from bare metal, we buy all the equipment and put, spend a lot of time putting them together, and then how do we get to the stage we can really run the distributed software? There are multiple steps. I can quickly go through that. First step is then you, you need to configure networking, make sure every, you know, all, all the VLANs, all the uh, IP addresses are set up. You configure the servers, make sure all these things are set up correctly. Then you have, for that step, you need to review a lot of vendor specific documentations, write a lot of hardware specific um, uh, scripts to do this. Second step, you install the OS and basic infrastructure, and each of that it's multiple steps. For example, OS, you have a multiple steps which depends on each other. So it's a basically a chain of operation. And you install device drivers, you install uh, security systems, account manage, and start basic storage. So it's each one is a lot of different steps. Then you finally you can get to a basic environment which you can deploy OpenStack packages. So OpenStack packages looks messy, but it's basically just a part of packages. As long as you know the list, you are fine, right? So this is an easy part of OpenStack configuration. So really, the hard part of configuration is to set up all the configuration files, make sure they match each other. And all the network node, compute node, if there is one IP address that doesn't match, it doesn't talk to each other. If there is a one configuration, say, which driver, OpenStack driver, Instance, it's a driver class you should use. You, if that thing doesn't match, it doesn't talk to each other. Right? So this is a hard part. It's wiring different components in OpenStack. And later, suddenly you have an OpenStack running, and then you customer, because customer want different things, you need to configure all these different kind of images containing different things. Right? Um, especially those uh, distributed infrastructure that's difficult to configure. Also, the, some proprietary software like MATLAB, you need to configure the license servers, these things. And next, you have an infrastructure, then you want to test it, you want to run it. We run a uh, Tempest, we run Rally to make sure it works. And we continue to run it, make sure it works as expected all the time. And if it doesn't, we have the monitoring, log monitoring infrastructure to monitor that. So that's six steps. Right? Uh, at this time, what you get? You get a number of configuration files and scripts. Also, what you have, you, we run Ceph servers. We know how to do its uh, mice, mice configuration. So we run a Ceph server. So we have a bunch of cookbooks with all the settings. Right? And then we have a bunch of system mean who is close to burnout, that kind of stage. But what we really don't have is we don't have a production cluster. So all the work has been done on a test environment. We, now we need to transfer that into a 
production cluster because the bunch of customers are already lose their patience, they are waiting, right? So the next step is transfer to production environment. But this is the usual logic because as a programmer, I will show you some code. So this is the logic. Basically, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, why? You have two choices. One is you debug in your production environment. One is you go back and test. So most, most people go back and test. It just go back to step one and restart. So what's wrong with that? Why is it difficult to do it? Because first, you need multiple people. You need, we, we got people from uh, Huawei. We got our own people. We got people from different hardware vendors. They need to work together. And then there is a lot of coordination to do. And it's difficult to coordinate because there are so many, just so many uh, documentations and scripts flying around everywhere, different format, different kind of language. It's a very steep learning curve for the architect or the, for the project manager. So, and also, there is a lot of human interventions there. Even if you have scripts, you need to know which script to run. Everything with human intervention is it's a very error-prone process. Of course, we use Ceph, we use Puppet. So this is a great deployment tools, but it only solves a part of the problem. It puts all the deployment scripts together. But what it doesn't put together is the environment. It says, OK, we have a cookbook. A cookbook needs input. The input is the environment parameters. What is environment parameter? You normally think IP address or the OS information, which directory you put it into. So that's networking and OS. But soon, if you install multiple layers of software, OpenStack, then on OpenStack you install uh, Hadoop, then you want to monitor everything. So the higher layer, the environment is really the entire environment of the lower layer. So it has a, this kind of complex dependency of all the environment parameters. The environment parameter is captured different places. Networking parameter is basically if you use uh, REST, uh, we use REST, we use PK8. So it's different kind of uh, router configuration scripts or configuration files. OS, we, we keep uh, them in the coupler Kickstarter files. And OpenStack, we happen to use Chef, use this cookbook, capture a lot of environment information. And we use Puppet also. Why we, and also we use Ansible. Why we give us too much trouble? Because we are not going through particular infrastructure. We are going through the scripts. They exist, exist in that community. We believe the, uh, the, this Puppet script is the best installing Hadoop, and then the Ansible script is best installing the monitoring log stash, because it doesn't really exist in the Chef community. So we, we are going through the scripts rather than the infrastructure, so we have different things. Then all, the inf all these uh, environment variables are captured different places, and it's copied, manually copied into different places. You change one place, you forget to change another. It's a typical way of copy and paste code. Second problem is operation. So I, I know you guys are OpenStack expert. So I, I don't think you will say OpenStack is the most reliable piece of software in the world. Right? So people, people discover all the problem. And it fails a lot of times. You need to fi figure out why. And even if OpenStack becomes solid, the hard hardware can still break. If we replace a server, then what something break, it works yesterday, but after I replaced server, it didn't work. What dependency or what environment did you break? It can be everywhere in, um, along the stack. And then maybe you forget to change one IP address somewhere you copy it, right? So it's not a single place capture the entire thing. And also, why it's difficult to figure out is because OpenStack is a fully decentralized infrastructure. Fully decentralized, basically, if something goes wrong, you look at all different information, and you look at on every single machine. You don't know which one caused the problem. It, sometimes it doesn't say. Right? Especially if you run distributed storage, like Ceph. It, sometimes it goes wrong. And then you don't know which OSD caused the, caused the problem. It doesn't say. Right? And the last problem is that change of idea of our customers. So one of my system means says, OK, researchers change very often. They change idea. And also, computer scientists, we are a computer science kind of department. So we have a lot of computer scientists. They change their idea like 
very often. They come from software background. They say, okay, I should be able to change, right? So how do we currently manage all the changes? It's this logic, right? So I have no idea if I change this, I tune this parameter, I, I maybe connect the network differently. Does it work? So what I do is I back up the data and start testing again. So it's completely another cycle. So the fundamental problem is that the operational knowledge we accumulated does not transfer from one person to another. The original engineer did the, the entire thing. He tells the second engineer, the second engineer understands nothing. Everybody needs to st build from scratch and multiple times in order to get it. Of course, if you are doing consulting business, that's good news for you because yeah, other, otherwise you, are, you will be out of business right, if this thing is easy to teach. But for other people, it's a nightmare. Okay, so then I'll give you the stage to Dr. Yang Shuo, who will tell how the open source project campus uh, really saves the day of the operation. Thanks. Thanks, Wei, uh, for the great introduction of uh, the whole context of our, our project. So um, we are uh, building an open source project called uh, Compass. And uh, we, uh, we started this project uh, from really a book. Uh, Dr. Wei, uh, Dr. Xu is a uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, uh, researcher from uh, you know, uh, industry back to the uh, academia. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a trained PhD, you know, going to the, um, going to the, uh, uh, you know, industry. So I started reading this book, you know, when, when it start, it came around. And it gives me a lot of uh, reflection. Let me reflect, you know, what happened in the, you know, industry. So if you th really think of uh, back to the 90s, right? You, we have Nix, which is the single box uh, networking resources. We have CPU, which is single box, uh, you know, um, computer resources, and we have disk, which is uh, the storage resources. And uh, Linux came around, and uh, basically Linux managed all the resources, exposed a single image of compute device, which is a computer. And uh, however. Uh, Linux didn't, uh, you know, take, you know, too wide until there is this uh, amazing, you know, e convenient tool like Live CD. Right. Nowadays, you insert Live CD into your computer, you know, it stand up your uh, computer from uh, bare metal. And uh, after that, you should have some kind of a tool to basically telling you, um, my computer is uh, working, what is running here. And that that's a known, you know, system monitor. And if you really look at this, in this uh, data center as a computer context, right now we have a switch, which is a data center networking uh, resources. We have a server, the compute resources, and we have a storage server, which is uh, storage resources. And uh, we are joining this conference to join this uh, great movement of uh, OpenStack. OpenStack, we all believe as uh, OpenStack community members, is forming this uh, joint big data center, uh, big uh, data center computer. So, however, uh, um, if you, I here I do a quick re, uh, survey. Probably people will say, standing up uh, OpenStack cluster is equally difficult. And we say, why don't we? started trying to build something that, you know, o o over time it can evolve into a live CD. Why don't we build something as, um, you know, uh, Dr. Xu mentioned, right? After you stand up your machine, your giant machine, you know, data center scale, um, how can you tell, the, your, tell your, um, you know, customer you are running well, right? So that's, what we you know, reflected from this uh, book. And uh, so <coughs> this is uh, two data centers. One is from Google, one the other is from, I think, Rackspace. Um, 
hopefully you, you guys know which is Google's, which is the other. But essentially, you know, once you have this uh, you know, joint uh, data center computer, you know, at this moment, right, you have uh, bare metal resources. And uh, right now, the community is trying to solve a pretty hard problem, which is standing up the cluster. And uh, that's uh, basically, we call it uh, zero touch deployment. We hopefully zero touch. Uh, it's a pretty hard problem. However, even with this get solved, we, I'm not saying the industry has solved this problem in, you know, in the context of uh, OpenStack. But even this is solved, we have another problem, rack and stack, right? And hopefully, you know, there are several you know, smart uh, robotics uh, company, right? They can you know, help us do something you know, to you know, reduce the human level rep repetition. And after that, you know, how can you design your um, you know, cooling system? How can you design your power system? What's the best way to wire them up? Right? You hopefully you have some smart design, some smart blueprint. Hopefully you know, uh, the AI industry gives us some uh, answer. But anyhow, this, this talk is really about uh, the very, comparing to all the three layer, we are really just started this easy part you know, in this context, which is a zero touch deployment problem. So as I said, this is a fr you know, from a book. Uh, we you know, read the book, we think of this problem, we start with thinking big, but we are all trained engineers. We want to you know, start small, start tangible. We want to solve something rather than writing a you know, res research paper. So uh, we basically want to build a gen general system to deploy any distributed system. Because this distribu distributed system makes the environmental resources a giant computer. Uh, we started with, with uh, OpenStack, but we are not limited to that. So extensibility is our primary design goal. So we started, uh, you know, um, you know, automate OpenStack cluster, and that take uh, quite a while. And then, um, you know, with much shorter time period, we were able to uh, deploy, you know, automate uh, Ceph. And we hope, you know, if in this audience you guys have, a, uh, you know, requirement of building Spark, building uh, Mesos, Mesos is another great, uh, you know, uh, tool to organize a data center computer, a scale computer. Talk to us, right? We can you know, exchange some idea, see whether Compass serve a foundation for you to start from there. So why, why we can even start thinking this? Because um, there is a pretty unified layering process for you know, data center deployment. First, you want to deploy some certain, certain of you know, host system. And then you want to deploy the distributed system, basically demons across the machines, and hopefully you config them correctly so that they can you know, talk to each other either master-slave way or you know, peer, peer, peer to peer fashion. They form a logical uh, cluster. So and the, in each layer of this, there is no lack of tools. And as uh, Professor Xu already mentioned, even with this tool available, this, this problem right now is still takes a lot of time to reason about. Why? Because even with this tool, to solve your problem, to build your data center computer, you first need to write a lot of boilerplate code. Only after writing those uh, boilerplate code, which is scripts, um, you start thinking, oh, I want to build that kind of system. I want to build seven machines with my testing, uh, you know, uh, OpenStack cluster. And I want to have this uh, HA you know, configuration of my control nodes, right? That's the real question you want to ask yourself. But you were, you, your primary time was wasted by this uh, you know, boilerplate code. So Compass will, uh, you know, the system as uh, a bunch of ingre computational ingredients. We will 
this uh, assists you know, all this modern data center as a software-defined infrastructure. They compute these three basic uh, you know, um, foundation. And uh, first, if you look at this uh, you know, environmental de devices, right? it's a server. You first, you want to install some uh, you know, daemon regarding the computing. And then some daemon regarding the uh, storage. Some daemon regarding the networking infrastructure. And with uh, SDN you know, movement, you, know, you even want to you know, have all your you know, uh, networking gears to build by this uh, you know, software. So I like the, in this uh, morning's keynotes, people are talking, I think Jonathan in the keynote said, uh, you know, you really want to build something like, like you know, building Legos, right? Um, my, my, my son likes Lego, and uh, basically I, I realized we are really doing this same kind of mindset, right? If we can do that, we, we are tracking the problem in a tractable way. So, as I said, you know, there is a zero, almost a zero difference between you know, server software and the networking software. Because if you really model your deployment process, you basically can deploy your you know, networking fabric with your, you know, uh, your networking ingredient onto those uh, environmental you know, resources. And then you configure them to the right controller, right? They can form the SDN uh, infrastructure. After that, you can do this uh, traditional server software management, right? If, that, if that's the way we can build together, then the whole data center, it can be fully automated. You are not having uh, any kind of vendor locking. That's the goal we want to achieve. So, as I said, um, and also, you know, um, Professor Xu mentioned the challenge. The challenge is you want to have your, your system in the mean or, you know, data center builder basically focus on, you know, what kind of my, you know, giant computer should look like. So we basically model, you know, all this stuff, necessary stuff into RESTful you know, resources. Basically, machine switches are the environmental re resources. Those are the resources you want to put your system onto. And then we have this model called the adapter. For example, uh, OpenStack is one adapter. It allows you to you know, deploy the you know, OpenStack onto the environmental resources. Once the, uh, you know, the system, the, the targeted, target system is uh, deployed onto the environmental resource, then you form a logical cluster. And then each node within that uh, you know, logical cluster is called a host, right? So basically, you can see on our website, uh, syscompass.org, uh, sys this is uh, one example of our uh, RESTful resource. And, um, here, as I said, uh, you know, you w really want to have your customer to focus what's the real problem he want to answer, he want to ask, and he want to un answer to himself. So, you know, you know, forget about uh, automation. Even without automation, you still want to answer these questions, these fundamental questions to yourself. And uh, for example, in this OpenStack deployment, you want to say, hey, what the bare metal resources I want to deploy my uh, you know, OpenStack packages onto? And that's uh, step one and two, right? You answer those through the you know, RESTful API. You se select the right uh, resources. And then you say, hey, I, because I'm already in the place of uh, in uh, installing OpenStack, I select uh, the adapter named OpenStack. And then I basically, is, I'm asked, you know, what kind of uh, OpenStack you want to um, deploy? Are you going to deploy HA mode OpenStack, right? Or if for testing purpose, are you going to just uh, deploy a single, single node uh, controller uh, node, uh, mode? After that, you basically, give the, you know, uh, the system administrator a feedback. 
pulling the the installation progress, right? Give the the give them the feedback. So basically, this is a very high level, you know, uh, diagram of our um, OpenStack design. So we provide a you know RESTful API, so that you know we you know expose the fundamental resources we believe the you know the application writer want to write basically the uh, data center builder and then we have a hardware management module we have a, you know a OS provision module we have a package deployment module as a professor Xu mentioned right people choose a certain you know um, certain uh, configuration management software because of those uh, scripts. We don't want to lock in. We don't want to select, pre-select a tool for you. We want to say, hey, whatever the best wheel out there, we want to leverage the existing wheel. We don't want to re reinvent wheel. So <clears throat> uh, as I said, you know, from the end user perspective, we really want to help you to build an extensible uh, system. So that extensible in a way, as of today, we can support OpenStack installation. We already supported uh, uh, Ceph. This, one year ago, this is uh, still black, right? You know, this can just keep going. And uh, if you are using ESXi, you know, there's nothing different between <laughs> ESXi you know, provisioning and uh, you know, CentOS provisioning, right? Theoretically, and uh, we we are supporting these hardwares. Uh, we tested it on HP hardware. We love uh, open source. Even you know uh, hardware, there is a movement uh, OCP, right? So if you in the in the audience there is uh, OCP, you know uh, developer, come to talk to us. So again, we are extensible in the uh, configuration management tool. We are ex uh, extensible in the you know, uh, OS provisioning tool. As, I said, as uh, Professor Xu said, you know, he, he doesn't want to be locked in to a certain tool chain. And we do not want to lock you in. Um, so um, Professor Xu mentioned, after this uh, stand up problem is solved, let's say we solved it, then you want to give your you know, daily operator some knob basically saying, hey, what's my you know, cluster, data center computer you know, about? Is it running well? So we basically say, to, to solve that problem, in a data center level, what, what basic uh, layer you want to build? Then we say, first of all, you need to have certain of, uh, you know, agent installing on your networking gears, installing on your compute gears. And uh, you need to have some uh, distiller, and you have you know storage engine. Most importantly, you want to expose those through you know a RESTful API. With that, the uh, the you know uh, big data researchers can consume this API, saying, "Hey, I can build a complex model to you know consume my you know daily operational data." So that's the fundamental. I'm skipping because of the time. I'm skipping this too. Um, so basically, that's you know we build the log management engine. We build the temporal data, the the performance engine, and um, let's uh, take a look at uh, the uh, demo. Let's see. That's okay. Uh, let me. Um, Yeah, let me fin finish the talk first. Um, oh, here, here we go. Wait, wait, how to start it? Okay. <laughs> okay, let me try, because this is a installation process. I'll skip that for the time being. Let's get started to the monitoring part. 
So for this monitoring, we, we build a, this uh, you know, a panel so that we can show the user, show the, user you know, the topology. And not only the physical topology, we can show the user the logical topology of your services. You can zoom in, zoom out, look at the alerts you know, over time. So that you know, you get, you get this uh, sense of uh, you know uh, ownership, and not only that, you know, you can consume on top of this uh, API, uh, doing you know, model-based uh, uh, analysis, and I think I'll conclude that uh, my talk here, uh, and I'll leave some Q and A sessions. Any questions? Yeah, please. Is this an open source project? It is. It is open source project, and uh, the uh, project uh, um, is is uh, you know following all the rules governed by OpenStack uh, you know StackForge che checking process. Not only that. Yeah. So that basically that is, and the uh, web page of our uh, open open source project is uh, syscompass.org. You can check it out. Oh, okay. please. On the, on the deployment right. and, um, and configuration side, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about there, that functionality already exists in tools like Mom. You can go to Eve every day. Sure. So Sure, sure, sure. Great, 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 great question. So lots of people are asking, hey, there is a triple O, right? Why, why, do, why do you guys even bother building that, right? There are, there are two answers to that question. Uh, back then, when we started building this project, you know, we evaluated uh, the, you know, the, the, the tools in the market. And uh, pretty much no tools can satisfy our, our needs. That's why we get started. And then the second answer to, to your question is, hey, if, what if this, this tool is getting mature, right? And the, you, you are basically building another wheel? Why, why bother? Um, the, the answer to that is, we are not building another wheel. We, we actually, we well thought of this. Uh, for example, if a triple O gets mature enough, triple O could be used as one you know, a driver for us to you know, remember this. Because for the time, time uh, constraint, I didn't mention this, uh, explain in detail this uh, plugin architecture. But we can use the, uh, the triple O or other tools to actually actuate these act you know, actions. So hopefully I answered your question. Please. How large is your project in terms of contribution, internal, external, and also in terms of so we great question. Uh, so we are holding. We, we hosted a, a you know a local meetup, and uh, you know the attendance is pretty uh, pretty good. Um, and uh, we have uh, we have this uh, Qinghua cluster, largest uh, largest one. So far, we we deployed. Uh, we have se several you know uh, much 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 smaller you know uh, deployment. So that's the consumer side. F from the uh, um, community side, as I said, we, we just get started building the community. Okay. Yep. So you're looking for more people? I look for, because I am a person who really believe collaboration will you know, grow the, the project. Um, and also, if you really think of what we believed for the first play, uh, we really want to, you know, different uh, people with different background. For example, if you guys are trying to build Mesos, for example, a Spark, right? We want to talk to you. How can we use the, our 80% like, of our existing code and write like 200 lines of uh, plugin right, to do something? Is that possible? That's an open question. Yep. Great question. 
that, uh, by the way, I, I want to make an announcement. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a uh, you know, design session in the afternoon. If you guys are interested in these questions, come to talk to us. And uh, that design discussion is really for this kind of questions. We, we are really open-minded. We want to hear what's needed and uh, whether that fits into our bill. Right? We don't want to say, oh, we don't want to scratch our tool to do something we are not good at. But if there is a similarity, there is a synergy, we want to hear you, and we want to discuss with you. OK, so we can maybe take the further questions offline. Uh, let's uh, take the uh, further question offline. Thank you. Thank you for attending.